Hey, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming. And thanks also to Amaze for inviting me out for this. So I'm talking about uh, the game that I'm working on currently, Where the Water Tastes Like Wine. Um, first, a little introduction. Uh, this slide kind of gets more boring every time I write it. But um, for a bunch of years, I worked on many different projects uh, as a programmer, mostly, uh, doing some other stuff here and there. But now I'm working on this game, Where the Water Tastes Like Wine. Uh, that's why I'm here today. I want to tell you all about it, uh, but specifically, mostly about how we're trying to make a different kind of narrative game. So a little background on the game, uh, if you haven't had a chance to check it out yet. Uh, it is playable uh, out there, so come by and find me, and you can check out our little demo that we have. Um, it's a game about spreading folk tales around a fantastical United States. It's set most firmly in the Great Depression era, the heyday of riding the rails around the country. It's inspired in large part by American roots music, uh, folk, bluegrass, blues, jazz. Uh, both the world describe it in those sorts of songs about down on their luck gamblers, meeting the devil at the crossroads, being beaten down by the bosses and the social fabric that folk songs and stories are part of, where one person would sing a song, another would learn it and kind of add their own to, uh, stuff to it and play it on down the road. Uh, in fact, that's where the title comes from. It's a line from an old song, or perhaps just an old folk saying. You can hear it in Going Up the Country by Canned Heat, or Going Down the Road Feeling Bad by The Grateful Dead, or Blowing Down This Old Dusty Road by Woody Guthrie, or Lonesome Road Blues, or older songs that don't even have names anymore. You can read it in Sometimes a Great Notion by Ken Kesey, or Mules and Men by Zora Neale Hurston. I'm not sure where the phrase originally comes from. Uh, it's sort of origins are lost in, in the mists of American history. Uh, but I like the idea and the fact that it's passed from voice to voice with no real owner. In the fiction of the game, the player has been compelled to a task. They lost a bet, which is why you should never play poker with mysterious strangers. And now they have a job. They're the personification of folklore. They are the thing that moves stories from place to place, that carries the threads of these tales around and ensures that they grow. The way they do this in the game is by having these little adventures. We call them vignettes. They get to choose their path through an encounter, but the choices don't change much about the character. Uh, instead, they determine what kind of story you'll get out of it. Perhaps one choice makes it a love story, while another makes it a tragedy. The player can take these stories, and when they meet one of the game's 16 different characters, they can tell the story to them, and in return, they'll be told a piece of that character's story. So if you tell a love story, then you'll hear back a piece of the character's life and story on the subject of love. So I know this isn't an American audience, and also the American school system is often somewhat lacking. Um, so I want to refresh your memory on the Great Depression and this era of US history. We're talking about the period around the 1920s to 1940s, uh, a few short years before the Wild West was over. The spread of settlers westward with their crops and their barbed wire put an end to the era of the cowboy and the open range. The indigenous people of the continent were brutally suppressed, killed or relocated to lands that nobody wanted. The rail network spread all over the US, connecting everywhere in relatively short, easy journeys, sometimes even in luxury. The 20s was a time of glittering excess, and then the crash in 1929 put an end to all that and started the Great Depression in the US. Very high economic inequality, unmatched until today, combined with a lack of regulation, especially over financial markets, set up the stage for a horrible economic catastrophe. The economic collapse and lack of jobs was exacerbated by the Dust Bowl, an environmental disaster caused by extended drought that hit the middle of the country and farming techniques that ruined the land. Human caused climate change. Banks failed in the wake of speculation and protectionist policies hastened the decline. Many Americans lost their homes to predatory mortgages and ended up homeless. They congregated in shanty towns that became known as Hoovervilles after Herbert Hoover, the president at the time. During this period, there were up to two million homeless people wandering the country as hobos. Industrial produ production fell 25, sorry, 45 percent. Starvation and disease were rampant. Hoover was eventually replaced by Roosevelt, who instituted giant infrastructure and government-supported employment programs that saved the country, building enduring projects such as bridges and dams that still last today. He also instituted major, reg major regulations protecting the banks for their own greed and instituting social safety nets, such as the Social Security Administration, setting minimums for wages and prices, 
and encouraging the formation of unions to increase the purchasing power of the working class. Of course, while it saved the country and improved countless lives, many in the country considered it evil, for it seemed like socialism. Some of these programs would be destroyed almost immediately, and others stood until very recently. So that's the world in which this game takes place, and a little about the culture and the history that we find ourselves in. The title, Where the Water Tastes Like Wine, has other meanings too, though. The game is about the American dream and chasing something that's impossible to find, or at least impossible to find in the form you're looking for. There is really no place where the water tastes like wine. So that's the central theme of the narrative. And that brings us back to a different kind of narrative game. What do I mean by that? Well, a traditional narrative game is like a novel. There's a central plot, maybe there's a few side plots, but there's one big story that's the focus of your attention. Where the Water Tastes Like Wine is instead a collection of short stories. It's an anthology. There are 16 different characters you can meet in your travels, and they each have their own story. They've all got something that they're searching for, their version of the promised land. What's more, each character is written by a different person. I went out and found a whole crew of writers, some really amazing folks, who each agreed to write one of these stories. And I'm going to tell you about why and how we did that. First, uh, here's our list of writers and characters. You may not be able to read all of these, uh, so I'm going to highlight a few who you might know. Lee Alexander wrote Little Ben, the coal miner. Cara Ellison wrote Dupree, the gambler. Austin Walker wrote Jimmy, the preacher. Emily Short wrote Bertha, the Dust Bowl refugee. Then there's other people who are experienced and talented game writers, like Jolie Menzel, who has worked at Telltale and Ubisoft. She wrote Ray, the cowboy. Anne Toole, who wrote for The Witcher and Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, wrote August the Sailor. Clara Sierran, who wrote Quinn, has worked on Crypt of the Necrodancers and Glitch Hikers. And then there are a few who are basically brand new to writing in games, but are incredibly talented voices, like Sidney Meeker and Stuart Arias. Why did I decide to do this, though? Why did I decide to hire all these different writers instead of just hiring one or writing it myself? Well, I knew that a story about America, about the failure of the American dream, and about the people left on the edges of society would have to tell some very particular stories. You can't hear the real story of America without hearing about the struggles of black folks, immigrants, indigenous people, and women. And I decided that while I could do a lot of research and a lot of interviews and tried to write those stories myself, I'm probably not the right person for that. I don't know that any one person would be right to tell all those stories. So I decided to embrace that as a strength. Every character being written by a different person means that we have diverse voice voices in many different ways. Each person brings their own distinct style to the writing, and so each character has a different sound and a different personality. Quinn, the hobo kid, speaks in an accent. Everything that Cassidy says sounds like a poem. The stories went places I never expected and never would have invented on my own. And as a bonus, I think we're breaking new ground in narrative games. Uh, as far as I'm aware, this is not an approach that has been taken before. But of course, it wasn't all easy. Maybe there are reasons this hasn't been done before. I'm going to go into some of the specifics of what was tough about this process, what worked, and what we learned. I'm also going to go into depth on the process behind a single one of our characters. So challenge one, uh, different writers have different voices. That's kind of the point, right? That was one of the things I wanted. But it also make it, made it tougher to have all the writing be consistent across all the different stories. Everyone has their own voice, their own style of writing. Um, so a little bit of that variation is great, but we still want the game to feel like a consistent whole. Uh, we tried to fix this by editing. We're working with the writers and on our own to make sure each character is matched with the others in some basic ways. It's constantly a balance, though, between consistency and preserving and respecting the author's voice. Challenge number two, uh, working with 16 different people, no matter what they're doing, is really tough, right? Especially as an indie studio. There's time and effort involved in getting everyone ramped up. With just one writer, you go through that process once, right? You get them on board, you tell them what sort of things you want, you make sure everybody knows what's going on. But with 16 different writers, you have to go through that process 16 times. Um, so there's also no way that we could kind of do as much exploration and innovation and discovery and iteration and all the great things that you do in a creative process with all 16 different people's ideas. Uh, I would have loved to have all their expertise on 
how best to construct these stories and make this game, but it just was not practical to involve 16 people in that creative process. So challenge number three, um, finding the right people was really difficult, especially because I wanted all these different voices. Jen Frank has written about the Rolodex problem. Uh, if most of the people in your network that you have all these connections with are white men, well then, uh, hiring people you trust and hiring for experience and things like that will only get you white dudes. So in several cases, I had to expand my Rolodex. I had to reach out through my network and ask, hey, do you know any Navajo writers? I had to put out a call on Twitter for people to write Rocio and Fidlina. And then challenge number four. There were some other problems that arose out of these 16 different people working independently. The way our writing process worked was that I would decide what the broad strokes of the character would be. For example, a preacher struggling with his faith, as in the book, Go Tell It on the Mountain. I'd do some basic research on that character and then pass that idea and a summary of my research on to the writer, and the rest was up to them. But then we had some things like the character Mason. He's a great war veteran from World War I. His story is about the Bonus Army, the, which is a march that the veterans made on to Washington to try and get paid by the federal government during the Depression. So that's cool, great story. Uh, but then Austin Walker writes this amazing character, Jimmy, uh, the preacher. It turns out then Jimmy is also a great war veteran. And then August, the sailor, uh, whoops, it turns out his story is that he was a merchant marine in World War I. So suddenly there's a lot more of World War I in the characters in the story than I had actually intended because the writers thought these were interesting directions or motivations for the characters. In that particular case, I just decided, well, I guess they found it in there on their own. Uh, these are great characters, and I don't want to throw them, throw them out. Uh, this, maybe this is something I should have given more space to. So now I guess we've got three World War I veterans in the game. That's fine. There were other cases where uh, something had to give, and one character had to be changed, or you know, the first draft would come in, and I would say, oh, actually, I don't think this is right, or this, this clashes with someone else, or you're just way off the rails, please try again. But you know, from the same place that, that those sort of collisions came from, I got what I wanted too. I got people with very different thoughts and ideas and inspirations making things that I never would have thought of. So Jimmy, the preacher, well, Austin Walker is into wrestling. Uh, so now it turns out that Jimmy's dad was a wrestler, a traveling show catch wrestler, which is a thing that I'd never even heard of before he wrote this character. Uh, but it, it fits perfectly into this world and this time period. This was an actual thing that people did during the, this era, was kind of travel around wrestling for money at shows. Um, so it fits perfectly, and that's wonderful. Uh, August, the sailor, he's inspired to travel by pulp adventure novels, which were also a big form of enter entertainment in this time. Dupree, the gambler. Dupree isn't just the archetype, sort of house of the rising sun, traveling gambler. Uh, it turns out she's a woman, and she's telling a subtle and complex story about what it means to be female in this world and the sort of power that's available to her. None of these things would have happened had I been writing all of these characters. And there's many more examples than the ones remaining. There's turns of phrase, motivation, metaphor, complex layering of themes on top of each other, fantastic things that I never would have written exactly like that, partly because I don't have the talent, but also because as one person I don't have nearly the diversity of life experience that these 16 people do. And then of course, I got to work with all these amazing, fantastic, talented writers who were really excited to have a chance to build a character basically from scratch and to participate in this exciting new narrative experiment. Getting an opportunity to work with just one of these writers would be a special occasion, and I got to work with all of them. I'm incredibly lucky and incredibly grateful to all of them for sharing their skills and participating in this project. Now I want to walk through the actual process that we went through for creating one of these characters. I'm going to focus on little Ben, the coal miner. He's a character that I knew I wanted from the very beginning of the conception of the game, right out of songs like Dark as a Dungeon or Cumberland Blues or The Dying Miner. I love the movie Matawan. It's a great John Sayles movie about the mine strikes in West Virginia and the war that broke out. So that's where my process starts. Uh, I conceive of that character. And this one fits 
well into our world. He's from the right time period. Uh, these mine strikes happened around the beginning of the 20th century and continued on for a long time. Um, he's definitely on the more downtrodden end of things, you know, he's a lowly coal miner. Uh, and what's he searching for? Well, he's a member of the United Mine Workers, and he wants fairness, safety, good working hours, and job security. Really, he wants socialism. He's looking for that part of the American dream that says if you work hard, and few people work harder than coal miners, you can fulfill your needs and provide for a family, that you can hold your head up in the dignity of your labor, and that you can ha have happiness beyond that, too. There's a famous slogan, the worker must have bread, but she must have roses, too. So the next thing I did was I read a lot of books. I narrowed down that while there were a lot of mine strikes and massacres and things like that that happened to miners during this period, um, the one that, that stood out the most to me was the Harlan County Mine Wars. And so I wanted to explore that one more. I read a bunch of accounts of what happened, some of them more firsthand than others. Uh, and I explored the history of the UMW, uh, Mother Jones, and the Pinkertons, the Baldwin Feltz detectives, and all these groups that were hired by uh, mine owners to kind of crack down on strikers and murder them in a lot of cases. Um, there was actually, like, this was a literal war where the U.S. government sent troops against the mine workers who were hiding up in the hills with guns. Bombs were dropped. It was, uh, it was quite a time. Uh, so I picked out all the things that I felt really spoke to this character, and I assembled a little dossier about this period and these people. And then I somehow convinced the amazing writer and former games journalist, Lee Alexander, to write this character. She took my notes and we emailed back and forth about the mood and the structure and so on and so forth. And she sent some drafts over and she just knocked it out of the park. I'm not gonna spoil the story for you, but I just wanna read a bit here. One thing they never tell you in the union is that it's hard to put your hand out to another, frightful even, when you don't know the road that runs from their fingers to their heart. But when they take your hand back and hold it, you know you've seen something in each other. And then the last part, which we've already seen a lot of up here, is the art. Once Lee had made this character, she and I and Kellen Jett, who's the artist who worked on this, this character, uh, we worked out what he might, might look like. So the basic version is pretty easy. He's got this old style reflector on his helmet with a candle and everything like that. He's leaning on a pickaxe. But there's one more dimension to these characters that I haven't explained yet. It has to do with my favorite poem. It's a line from Sunflower Sutra by Allen Ginsberg. We're not our skin of grime. We're not dread, bleak, dusty, imageless locomotives. We're golden sunflowers inside, blessed by our own seed and hairy, naked, accomplishment bodies, growing into mad, black, formal sunflowers in the sunset. So every character in the game isn't only what you see first. They're golden sunflowers inside, too. And if you gain their trust, you'll get to see their true inner selves. For little Ben here, that's not just one miner, but a whole union of them, lamps ablaze, rising from the coal dust that chokes them and smashing the tools of their oppression. Thanks. I have a lot of time for questions. Yes. Uh, yeah, so there's a couple different, uh, yes, sure. So uh, he asked about the, the skeleton figure that you see in the artwork and in the game. Uh, the player's avatar is this sort of skeleton that towers over the landscape. Um, so there's a couple different things that I want to talk about there. Um, one is that uh, the, the, this game is sort of divided into both an overworld map sort of thing, like a JRPG that's sort of an abstract uh, layout of the United States. And the game covers the entire United States. You can walk all the way from uh, Maine to Los Angeles uh, and ride trains, hitchhike, do all, all that stuff. Um, and so the fact that the skeleton is oversized in relation to everything else is uh, part of that abstraction of the map concept. Um, the reason you're a skeleton, uh, fictionally, in the game, uh, I talked a little bit about um, you 
begin by losing a poker game with this figure who then curses you to wander the United States, uh, spreading stories from place to place. And as part of that, he says he strips your flesh from your bones so that you have less to carry on your journey. Um, but the actual reason that the player is a skeleton is that a skeleton uh, has no age, has no race, has no gender, and makes a very good avatar for pretty much anyone to put themselves into, uh, in addition to making it so that we don't have to worry about who the player actually is, because the story of the game and all these stories that you encounter and tell are not about you as the player, they're about this world and they're about the people that you meet. Uh, their stories are the important ones, not yours. Uh, yes, in the back first. Uh, so the question is, had I considered using a wiki or something similar to keep uh, all the writers on the same page so that they all know what they're doing? That is a really good idea, and I wish I had done that from the beginning. Uh, I was not nearly that well organized when I started this project. Um, I knew kind of what I wanted, and I was sort of emailing people, and I don't know how many people here are writers or deal with writers on a regular basis, um, but writers, uh, maybe this is true of a lot of people in indie games, but writers especially uh, are not always great at hitting deadlines or communicating or uh, other various things. So 16 of them all at once, uh, it was very hard to get them all on the same page. Plus, um, some of them, like when I, when I started this project, I had an idea of the general characters that I wanted, um, and I talked to one writer, Gita Jackson, and so she wrote the first character for me, and we sort of had a process of figuring out what, what writing a character looked like. But uh, the last character um, was written by Austin Walker uh, and was done only a couple months ago. So this is a span of like, I don't know, two years or something like that, that the entire writing of the writing process took because Again, my organizational skills are not great, and I didn't line up all the writers beforehand. I sort of did this as a rolling, rolling snowball of uh, adding people to, to this project. Yes? Uh, yes, yeah, so the question was, there's uh, two questions. One was about the preacher character and whether the writer for that was religious or not. And uh, the other was uh, about whether I had specific writers in mind for specific characters. Um, the second one is really easy, so I'll answer it first. Not really. I pulled the characters from um, the kind of songs that, uh, the, the, the archetypes that exist in a lot of these songs, plus a lot of the characters that I felt were either pivotal in American history, like the, the coal miner strikes or whatever, or things that have been more ignored, uh, like the, the long walk of the Navajo, or um, there's the uh, hobo kid who uh, turns out during the Great Depression, a lot of parents essentially took their older children and kicked them out of home because they couldn't afford to feed them anymore. And so they said, you have to go fend for yourself now. Um, and so a lot of those I wanted to highlight. Uh, and then um, Austin wrote to me, uh, Austin Walker wrote, wrote that, the preacher character, um, and when I asked him about writing it, he said, this is amazing, this is perfect, because, um, because of personal experiences throughout my, the last year or so of my life, um, I've been thinking a lot about this particular question. And I actually didn't really ask him whether he was religious or not. Um, that comes through a little bit in the character, I think you can see uh, the, the preacher is not, um, he's definitely, there's some, there's some struggles there and things like that, but it seems like at the heart of it, he, he believes in, in God, uh, and he doesn't necessarily believe in himself as much, or himself as an instrument of God as much. Um, but I think that that's, that's actually one thing that I'm a little uh, regretful of. Uh, I'm not really religious myself, but of course, 
the United States, especially at this time, is very much so uh, during the Great Depression. Especially, a lot of people turned to faith, and there were a lot of you know traveling preachers and and you know the giant tent revival shows and all that stuff that uh, that played into this. Um, but it turns out that uh, games journalists and writers and people like that that you find uh, are are not necessarily religious uh, very much. So um, I don't know. We have some characters where that that came through strongly um, and others where it didn't quite as much, but yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, so the, uh, the question is about Gone Home, which is the last game that I worked on, and how the storytelling, this is obviously a very different game in a lot of ways, and how that storytelling uh, changed from one to the other. Um, so I should say first that I didn't have, I was not the writer on Gone Home. Um, you know, we all sort of contributed ideas and things like that, but most of the writing was done by Steve, uh, and then Carla uh, helped with that as well. Um, but in general, uh, I've worked on kind of first-person narrative games for most of my career, uh, and I wanted to change that up a little bit. Uh, I felt like it would be interesting to work on something a little bit different. Um, and I also thought that there were, there were some interesting ideas I wanted to pursue about that. Uh, the way that Gone Home worked is that Steve did a bunch of research and a lot of personal interviews to kind of get the story because he's obviously not uh, a teenage lesbian in the 90s. Um, so he asked a lot of people like what, what that experience was like and kind of assembled that story. And again, I felt like I wasn't going to be qualified to do that for all the different stories I wanted to tell. Um, but in, in another way, uh, this game is more like Gone Home than you might think in that um, Gone Home is about assembling a narrative through exploring a space and kind of piecing together what, what happened here, right? And uh, each of these different characters, when you talk to them, um, if you tell them, you have a bunch of different categories of stories that you can tell them, and if you tell them, uh, you know, four different stories or seven different stories or something like that, you won't, you'll hear pieces of what their life is like, but you won't hear all of it. Uh, and on top of that, there, each character has three or four chapters of content that they, of story that you can go through. And so it actually takes a while to assemble, to get a feeling for who this person actually is. And if you don't ask, if you don't tell the right story and kind of ask the right question, you might miss a key piece of information that really tells you who this person's motivation is. Um, and so, uh, in, in some way, this game is about wandering around an environment, collecting pieces of story, and sort of assembling them together in your own brain to come up with what the, the story as a whole is, which is, you know, basically gone home. <laughs> this game is basically gone home. That's the tagline that Kotaku reporters should take from this. Uh, we might be... Oh, we've got a couple more minutes for questions, I think, probably. No one stopped me yet. Two more minutes, so. Uh, yes, in the back there. Uh, yeah, so the, the question was about um, literature and poetry and games and how difficult and delicate that is to connect those two things. Um, and you're absolutely right. Um, I think that in the past, games have taken a lot of inspiration from movies. Uh, that seems to be what a lot of people look at to draw story and even visual um, inspiration from. And I, I mean, I, I like movies. They're, they're great. But I'm really mostly a reader. I really enjoy literature and poetry and things like that. And so that's partly why I wanted to make uh, a literary game. Um, I think part of doing that uh, is definitely getting these writers who have the right kind of talent to write in a literary fashion. Um, 
there's a lot of games writing uh, does not really go in for subtlety, shall we say, um, which isn't bad, but like you need to, they, the, the primary motivation is kind of clearly conveying a story and telling what the player, what their motivations are and things like that. And in a scenario like this, where again, the player kind of assembles the story uh, inside their own brain and it's more like, or it's meant to feel more like um, reading a, a book or a poem and trying to pull out the emotional connections and the themes from that. Um, I think you need, you need people with kind of a, a delicate touch on the words, um, which is another reason why I didn't really feel qualified to uh, write this whole thing myself. Um, I, I enjoy writing, but I'm by no means a professional. Okay, probably one more question or we might, oh no, sorry, that was it, we're done. Thank you all again.